Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be discussing the new cards from Crimson Vow, Magic's newest expansion, and the impact that these cards may or maybe may not have in, in Modern, which is, of course, everybody's favorite format, and probably the reason why you're in this channel right now. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, the cards that I think that have the potential of being good, the cards that I'm pretty certain that are going to be good, and then also about the cards that uh, I want to be good, if that makes sense. <laughs> that those cards that really, really speak to me personally and, um, and I'm going to be excited about playing with and trying out. Uh, so uh, this top 10 is obviously going to be very, very um, subjective in a way. Uh, and uh, these are the things that I'm taking into account. And I will probably discuss them individually once we get to the cards. Uh, if you are enjoying this kind of content, of course, as usual, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and leave me a comment down below with some feedback, what you liked, what you didn't like, so maybe the next video can be a little bit better for you. So, without further ado, let's get going. Honorary mention for the actual best card in the set, uh, Thalia, of course, <laughs> just a reprint, but um, yeah, kind of a wasted opportunity to have another cool version of Thalia like we did have in the previous version of Innistrad. Uh, but yeah, uh, even the years have not been very kind to Thalia in Modern, but, you know, <laughs> it's still the best card in the set for, for the format, I think. Another honorary mention is Voice of the Blessed. Uh, this is for those, <laughs> for those devoted, devoted Soul Sister gamers out there. Uh, the deck has not been good, but every now and then you will have this person at the at the LGS or that person on Magic Online that just loves the archetype and they're gonna be super stoked about this one. Um, the deck has not been good for years, probably hasn't been good for decades honestly, but <laughs> but uh, some people out there are really stubborn and they play the same deck over and over again. Mm. The last honorary mention that we're gonna be talking about is a card that was just a little bit late to the party. Um, the prowess deck was a very, very dominant force uh, back in the Heliod times, and uh, this card would have been, I think, absolutely fantastic in that deck. Uh, but uh, instead, we are left with, uh, you know, a card that just probably doesn't even have a home since the prowess decks have all but disappeared at this point. Of course, this is because of the printing of cards like Prismatic Ending and Solitude, which uh, are very, very tough for those decks that solely rely on uh, sticking one of the few-ish creatures that they play in the deck. So uh, I feel like this card is unfortunately not going to see any play at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, never discount the, the powers gamers. Maybe somebody out there is still jamming with some Soul Scar mages and whatnot. Uh, and they are going to be pretty happy that this card was printed. And we're starting off with number 10. We got Hullbreaker Horror. Now, this is a card that it's pretty interesting because we have a couple of ways uh, to look at this one. Uh, the most uh, broken, I guess, way of doing so would be to use it as a reanimator target. Uh, we have seen uh, in the latest set with the card like Persist, there's a, sort of a premium in good, powerful, unique um, reanimator targets that are not legendary. So, um, Hullbreaker Horror kind of fits the bill. It can do something similar to what a Tidespout Tyrant did in the past in Legacy Reanimator decks, in which it allows you to play through cards that you may otherwise struggle with. Um, and so, it's kind of interesting that we can have access to this uh, to this card in, in... I mean, the body is also pretty sizable as well, right? Uh, the other way to look at this card is as a Control Mirror Breaker. Um, I don't know how much I like it in that sense, unless you're doing something like Wilderness Reclamation, which you definitely could, so you can, you know, float a bunch of mana and just, like, play the whole Breaker Horror in your own end step, so you have a bunch of mana up to protect it, uh, because, you know, the, the fact that it can uh, return itself to its owner's hand is a big deal, which makes it sort of unkillable, even through something like a Supreme Verdict. So you can play the Hullbreaker Horror on your own end step and then you untap all of your mana and then you have, you know, just any spell can protect it, which is very cool. Um, but uh, it's not so much in the control mirror as well because of the card Solitude. Like Solitude is uh, kind of an absolute banger, obviously, and one of the best cards in the blue-white control decks and the four-color control decks right now. And that card is played as a four-off. So uh, the fact that, you know, if you are play planning on playing this in your opponent's sense that your opponent can just solely to this, and that's kind of it. <laughs> so uh, there's not really that much of an option. I guess you could flash in your own solitude in order to protect it, but like, is it really that good a deal at that point? Um, 
The card is cool enough though that I think that it, it could see some play and it has a ton of potential. So Hullbreaker Horror is going to be number 10. Number 9 is a very interesting one in Wandering Mind. This is a 3 mana 2 1 flyer. And when you enter the field, you get top 6 cards of your library and you can get a non creature, non land card from them and put it into your hand. Um, I think it's very important not to underestimate this kind of effect, particularly when it's stick to a body. Uh, there's the possibility of blinking this, there's a possibility of just bouncing this and recasting this. Uh, there's like a variety of ways that you can take get value from this. Also, it's a 2-1 flyer, right? Um, it, it, is, it is a solid body, like 2 power is a lot if you are, uh, if you have played some Pseudo Twin back in the day. The amount of, <laughs> the amount of games that a Pestermite, just like a random 2-1 flyer, could win in a blue-red deck is surprising. Like just that paired up with some lightning bolts and stuff it can really end the game uh, before your opponent has even the time to to really figure out what the hell just happened uh, so uh, i don't know what shell this card could see play in uh, but i I'm, I'm not sleeping on this kind of effect we already saw how um there's the the two mana one one that saw playing hammer this myth right and I feel like a lot of people completely ignore that card at the beginning and that card so a lot of wide play. Sure, like Lurus was a big part of that puzzle and this one cannot play along, cannot be played alongside Lurus, so it's a different kind of thing. So this seems like a powerful card that could see play because it's a powerful effect but doesn't really have a home and that is what it's missing. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of those uh, in this in this kind of set. A um, lot of cards that, and, and this is what this kind of set should do, right? Like standard sets should do this kind of thing where they are cards that are kind of make you ask yourself the question, like where can I play this and where can this be good? Um, so maybe we see Wandering Mind being good right now. Maybe we see him being good in six months or something. Who knows? But it is number nine in our top 10 list. Coming up at number eight, we got Path of Peril. For one black black, you get to destroy all creatures with mana value two or less. Sure, it has that cleave cost, but we don't really care about that. Like, that's never gonna matter, really. Um, it is interesting because of that clause, though. Because it is very uh, it is very powerful to be able to get rid of not only two CMC cards, but also being able to get rid of construct tokens is the big deal here. Ursa Saga is a very dominant part of the metagame, and we saw the effect of cards like Colin Ritual uh, that we have seen in, in, some, in some decks that have, it have been popping up and it has been doing some really, really good work. Um, Colin Ritual is one more mana, but it also gets rid of, of cards like Sigarda's Aid and uh, stuff like that, Hammers and whatnot. So it is interesting to, you know, compare what's going to matter more, getting rid of those kind of cards versus the extra mana. Um, but this card is certainly interesting because three mana is very, very cheap for a Wrath Effect. And that's what we, th that's what matters here. That's what, that's why I'm talking about this card right now. Uh, the only interesting thing is that there are a lot of three drops that kind of matter, particularly because Lurus, uh, <laughs> against all of the, you know, decks that you would bring this in, Lurus is a very important piece of the puzzle, and it is so good at recouping all the card advantage lost when you wrath them. But being able to kill, like, multiple Memnites and, like, Aspen Sentinels and, uh, you know, whatnot uh, for only three mana, it's a really, really big deal, uh, particularly against the Hammer deck where, uh, you know, you may not make it out until turn four <laughs> because you may just be dead. Uh, so Path of Peril is, is going to be a card that I think that we're going to be considering in the sideboards for the future, uh, for, for the near future. And uh, it's a card that you, if you're a black mage, you definitely want to be keeping in the back of your mind when you're building your modern sideboard. Coming up at number seven, we got Inspired Idea for two and a blue at Sorcery Speed. You have a draw three cards, your maximum hand size is reduced by three for the rest of the game. And you can also pay the cleave cost of five in order to get rid of the, the bad part of that. This kind of effect is very, very powerful and very hard to come by. Being able to draw three for only three mana is almost unheard of, besides scars like, for example, Painful Truth or something like that. Um, this card I can see slotting into combo decks that can find a way to uh, kind of ignore the last part, you know, because your hand size being uh, reduced doesn't really matter if your opponent is dead and the game is over. So um, 
I think that this is a card that could be a pretty solid cyber card that can allow some combo decks to grind. I am thinking stuff like potentially Adnosium, uh, Lotus Breach combo, stuff like that. There's also the random uh, interaction with Reliquary Tower that prevents the downside of this, just turn this into a 3 mana draw 3. And that seems like a little bit cute for me, but it's something that's out there. And that is, I, I'm, I have high hopes for this card in the format. And I wouldn't be surprised to, you know, get out, out ground <laughs> by, by this card from a combo deck out of nowhere. At number six, we got a little bit of a boring one. This is Lantern of the Lost, an artifact for one single mana. When it enters the battlefield, you exile target card from a graveyard and you can pay one and tap it and exile this lantern in order to exile all cards from all graveyards and draw a card. So uh, it's like we have Soul God Lantern, we have Relic of Progenitus, and then we can staple both of them together and we get Lantern of the Lost. We have the ETB uh, actual targeted uh, hate, which can be very, very powerful if you're playing against uh, some Croxa deck or some specific sort of combo deck. And then you have the uh, Relic uh, effect of exiling or graveyards. Um, this is interesting, like it's just another card that we're going to have access to in, when we're building our deck, but I feel like the upsides and downsides of all three of these cards are fairly unique. Like for example, you won't Soul Guide the Lantern in all of your Lurus decks because, you know, the, the, it doesn't exile your own graveyard, which is a big deal there. Uh, you also want Soul Guide whenever you're trying to face against a fast combo decks because it doesn't require you to hold up that one mana. But if you're playing against something like the Merc Tide deck, it's a lot better to have access to Relic Opportunities just because it can really grind down and slowly make sure that your opponent uh, doesn't get Delirium for DRC or Unholy Heat and stuff like that. So the different upsides and downsides is something that we're going to need to make sure that we keep in mind whenever we're building our cyborgs. But all of these cards are fairly similar in what they do. And, uh, you know, different changes of the metagames are going to turn one of these into, you know, slightly better than the other one. Or maybe, like, the way that you build your deck, you know, who knows. Uh, but it is definitely a card that I expect to see play and to pop up every now and then. So don't be surprised to see this one in your modern event. Okay, at number five, we got probably what in my personal list would be number one. Uh, this card is the one that I'm the most excited about trying, and uh, it's fairly unique in what it does. So let's take it step by step. Cultivator Colossus for four uh, green, green, green. It's a creature plant beast with trample, star, star. The power and toughness is equal to the number of lands you control. And here's the nice part. When it enters the battlefield, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. If you do, you draw a card and you repeat this process. What this means is that every single card that you have in your hand is going to end up in play and you're going to be drawing a spell for each one of those cards that you that you have uh, that you have put into play couple of things with this one. Number one, it doesn't go uh, infinite with Bounce Land. So if you were thinking about doing that with Bounce Land, it just doesn't work. So the way that it would it would, it would actually work out would be you would just, uh, you know, the Bounce Land trigger would go on the stack while you're still resolving this ability. So all of your draw cards happen at the same time. And uh, yeah, that's, that's just the way that it works, unfortunately, because uh, definitely it would be cool for this to go infinite. Uh, but this is still a card that I think has potential, specifically in Amulet, and the reason for that is that if you have an Amulet in play and you are adjusting your play patterns in order to take advantage of this card specifically, what you can do is you can draw like, you know, five plus cards if you hold a couple of, of lands into play, and you can play this massive bomb. Uh, it's also a beast for, you know, com uh, shares a creature type with, uh, <laughs> with a Royal Racer for cavernous soul purposes. So extra upside. Um, and you, would, you can draw like five plus cards and all of those lands that you put into play are also going to end up because of the amulet, meaning that you're going to have mana to do even more stuff in that same turn. So because of that, I think that this could be a potential card to play as a one-off in the sideboard against the control decks in the format, which, you know, they are very, very... Um, powerful. <laughs> they have really, really good ways of assembling card advantage, and this is a way that we can actually get that, some of that card advantage and outgrind something like the Fairy Hero of Dominaria, not only by playing a massive threat, but also by doing even more stuff on the same turn. Maybe haste the threat, maybe play a Primeval Titan alongside this bad boy. Uh, so, 
bunch of things that you can do. Um, but uh, it's one of the things that is hard to evaluate because the play patterns are going to be something that we have not really seen before. Uh, so it's going to take a little bit to get used to, but I have high hopes for, for the Cultivator Colossus. Um, definitely the most explosive card in the list and the one that is the weirdest and the most potential for just being busted. Coming at number four, Wash Away. This is a very interesting card that has potential to become a cyborg staple if uh, some things change in the format. So um, it's an instant for one blue. It says counter target spell that wasn't cast from its owner's hand. So when you read this, obviously, the big, big part about this is that it counters cascade spells for a single mana. So uh, if it were just because of this, I don't think the card would be playable at all. But the fact that it has the cleave cause that for one blue blue allows you to counter any spell, I think that this has actually uh, the potential of being pretty solid. Um, some of the uh, Cascade decks have started to pivot a little bit, and we saw that with uh, Doomwake dominating with uh, the, the Uranus deck that he's been doing well with, and that deck plays the Fairy Time Raveler. So... It's very, very awkward when you're playing your control deck and you have your Fluster Storm ready to go. You feel like there's no nothing that can go wrong for you and your opponent just casts this Teferi and you stare at the Fluster Storm and you look at the Teferi and you stare at the Fluster Storm and you concede the game in shame. So now instead of doing that, you can simply pay the cleave cost and wash away and you can just counter the Teferi straight up. Uh, because of that, I think that this card has potential. I think that Cascade would need to be very, very dominant in the metagame for me to want something like this, uh, but who knows. There's also like a couple of random other things that this can counter is anything that you get off of Bring to Light. If you if your opponent goes for Expressive Iteration, like the card that they exile is technically not being cast from the, uh, from the, the hand, and also cards from Dredge, like uh, Ox of Agonas or something like that can be countered for a single mana. So keeping those things in mind, you know, this is just another option that we're going to have access to from now on. I wouldn't be too surprised if it shows up, but again, it would certainly need uh, for a specific metagame to have developed in order for this one to dominate. Now we're getting into the top three, and on number three, we actually have a card that I have not really seen that many people talk about. Cartographer Survey is a 4-mana sorcery, costs 3 and a green, it lets you look at the top 7 cards of your library, you put 2 land cards from among them onto the battlefield tapped, and the rest in the bottom of your library. This is a very powerful effect at 4-mana. In the past we've seen cards like Hour of Promise, but what Cartographer Survey does that Hour of Promise doesn't, is it costs one less mana, and that can be very, very important whenever you're playing a deck that has Explore as one of the you know main main cards. So any deck that plays Scape Shift wants to be you know playing Farseek, playing Explore, and it's very, very awkward sometimes when you go you know turn one tap land, turn two Explore, and on turn three you're just like playing another Ramp spell. Well, Cartographer Service says okay. Next turn, you're just casting your Titan, or your Scape Shift is going to be lethal, or something like that. Like, this card is very, very good in that specific context. So, I would be surprised if people don't at least try this card out. Um, also, you can go, like, turn 3, uh, Dryad, into turn 4, play this. And if you happen to find a Valakut in the top 7 cards of your library, you're just kind of all set. <laughs> you kind of can't, can't lose. Uh, but in, at that point, you know, like, our promise would be better. Um, there's also the upside that this has against cards like Ashiok or a a Shadow of Doubt, so definitely another thing to keep in mind as well. Also, your opponent doesn't get to Archive Trap you for free if you're playing against Mill, so... <laughs> For whatever that's worth. Uh, but yeah, Cartographer Survey, I think it has a lot more potential that people are giving it credit for, and maybe it's because it's a green card or whatever, but uh, I think that this card should definitely see some play in modern. Coming up at number two, we have Reckless Impulse, one in a red for a sorcery that lets you exile the top two cards of your library and allows you to cast them until the end of your next turn. So this is basically light up the stage, but it always costs two mana, as opposed to, you know, light up the stage, which can cost three or one. So you are kind of splitting the difference every single time, so this card is a lot more consistent. Um, this also has a couple of other upsides, which, you know, light up the stage is always uh, played alongside prowess creatures. This allows you to play your prowess creature um, 
you, to play this, so you can attack with your prowess creature, meaning that you get to trigger prowess, dealing one extra damage. Also, it means that you don't need to, you know, lava dart your opponent's face or like bolt your opponent's face in order to enable your light up the stage. This one will always cost two, and that can be uh, pretty solid in certain circumstances, just much, much better than what light the, light of the stage has to offer so again we talked about uh, in another card previously that would be good for prowess and reckless impulse can potentially get in there as well this one can also be played in other decks as well uh, which is pretty cool like we see how insane expressive iteration has become and how dominant it has become in in the format and reckless impulse i don't want to say that it's close to expressive iteration but it's kind of as close as we've, as we've had. Drawing two cards for two mana is pretty busted. So um, with that in mind, I think that Reckless Impulse will see play. I would not be surprised if it, is, if it even sees play in some other context besides uh, Strictly Powers decks. So number two is going to be Reckless Impulse, a card that I have very high hopes for. And at the very, very top, number one, we have Blood Fountain, a card for single black. It's an artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you create a blood token. These are the new mechanic from the set, which says it's an artifact that uh, for one mana and you tap it, you discard a card and sacrifice it in order to draw a card. And then it has some extra line of text, which is three in a black. You tap it, you sacrifice Blood Fountain, and you return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. Um, it's very, very... Um, it's very, very hard to evaluate something like this in the abstract, but whenever you look at decks like the Asmo decks of the past, any deck playing Ursa or something like that, those, those decks care about just having stuff. It doesn't matter what that stuff is, but they care about having stuff in play. And the fact that this card can create two stuff for only a single mana, it's a very, very big deal. It also doesn't cast cost you extra cards in order to do that. Uh, just think of something like uh, the Underworld Cookbook, which works, works really well with Asmo as well. Um, but that one actually costs you uh, discarding a card in order to create another another something. So uh, this, car, this card just does so by itself, doesn't need any help. And uh, the late game, in the late game, the activated ability can actually be much more than just flavor text. Like if, if you're going to like turn eight, you played a couple of Ursas, you played an Asmo, you played something like that, and an Emery maybe, and your opponent countered it, killed it, whatever. Now you can sack this and you can get two of those back. Like that's pretty insane, honestly. So I would not be surprised to see like blue black Ursa they explain maybe the full playset of this Blood Fountain card. I'm pretty sure that somebody like Doom Waker is going to be doing a lot of brewing with Blood Fountain. Uh, but uh, this card is so innocuous, but I think it's far and away the card that has the most potential to be doing something very, very good. I don't want to say broken, because uh, decks like that simply have not been good enough in Modern in the past. Uh, but uh, this is the one that has the most potential to be um, to simply become a staple of the format, at least a staple in like tier two or tier three decks. Uh, but uh, Blood Fountain is is no joke. Don't sleep on this card. I know it's a common. It doesn't look particularly impressive, uh, but I think that this card, in for what I've seen on Twitter and talking to other content creators, uh, this is I think the card that everybody's the most excited about. Not too excited about it, but I do think that it's the most powerful card in the in the entire set. So uh, hopefully uh, somebody breaks it because it's probably not gonna be me. All right, it's time to wrap this one up. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Uh, Crimson Vow actually brings uh, more to the table than I was expecting. Uh, when I was already going through the spoilers, I thought that this set was just gonna be another fluke and uh, to be fair though, like it's better when these sets are flukes. <laughs> we don't want Okos and Uros and Heliods and all of these, uh, you know, your standard sets completely dominating in effectively rotating formats like Modern or Legacy whenever they show up. Like this is the perfect power level that we want for a standard set. And uh, this deck actually has a lot more uh, potentially playable cards than I was expecting that we would see. Um, Particularly because, you know, at the beginning of the spoiler season, uh, the, the cards that they were showing were probably not even good enough for standard for the, the vast majority of them. Um, but uh, I think that the, the set actually is is very, very, uh, very interesting. And it, it does the right thing, which is 
buff uh, some uh, archetypes that are you know not particularly great or give a couple of small little tools here for uh, other archetypes that uh, you know tribal decks and stuff like that that uh, need a little bit of an extra push in the modern format uh, and it doesn't seem like there's anything that is going to to scream you know ban me or anything like that so uh, I'm looking forward to trying out some of the new cards. You, I mean, you will for sure be seeing some some Colossus content coming up next. Uh, but uh, for now, this is going to be the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you let me know in the comments. And if you did also, make sure you hook me up with a like or a subscription. Maybe, maybe if you feel like so. I will see you in the next video, folks. Have a fantastic rest of the day and take care. Bye-bye.